Over this past week, you guys have been sending me a ton of stories. You've been flooding my inbox with all sorts of different things, which I completely appreciate. Every time you guys send me stuff, I look at pretty much everything and I filter through it to see what's worth making a video about. And today is pretty much gonna be a mishmash of a bunch of different things that you guys have sent me over the past week, mostly real estate related. And I wanna start off with some of the problems that we're seeing with short-term rentals because short-term rentals really blew up in popularity over the past decade, especially once Airbnb came on the scene and Verbo and all these other websites that actually started you know, promoting this as a business model for people to make extra money. And of course, we've seen a ton of inventory being removed from the US housing market and being used for short-term rentals. Well, a lot of different cities and towns across the country are starting to make their own rules and regulations against this. And I wanna cover this specifically related to Florida to just give you guys an idea of how much things have changed with this. So according to AirDNA, they track everything Airbnb, okay? In December of 2023, there were 22,000 available Airbnb listings in Miami-Dade County, which is a 19% increase from 2019 and Broward County saw a massive 71% increase from 2019 with about almost 18,000 available listings. Earlier this month in February, both the Florida Senate and the Florida House introduced two different bills to start helping local governments regulate short-term rentals. In fact, uh, Senate Bill 280 is going to allow local governments to create vacation rental registration programs and it's also going to cap maximum overnight occupancy and would establish a uniform set of regulations throughout the state. And so the reason why this is important is because this is going to give more power to local governments to decide what they want done with short-term rentals, guys. And a lot of places are just flat out banning them because the residents are tired of it, especially if you live in a neighborhood like this. And the last thing you want is, you know, the party house next door constantly bothering you and, you know, always having turnover and problems with the house. And you're just trying to have some peace and quiet enjoyment of your neighborhood and you can't because of the party Airbnb next door. I realize not all Airbnbs are bad like that and not everybody's going to have that experience. I mean, you can have an Airbnb next door for years and maybe not even know it because everybody who shows up is just peaceful and quiet. But with this Senate Bill 280, it's going to allow local governments to create vacation rental registration registration programs. So a lot of people who are operating these short-term rentals across the state of Florida right now and really throughout the country are doing it in a completely unregulated way. And what this is going to do is number one, it's going to allow the local governments to get their piece of the pie. Of course, that's the main motivation for most of this, I would imagine. But beyond that, what it's also going to do is it's going to make it so that it's going to be harder to register a short-term rental because there's gonna be criteria, there's gonna be zoning of where you can and can't do it. That's something we have in Miami Beach where I live. There's only a few sections of the city where you're allowed to do it and all the single family homes, there's no short-term rentals allowed at all. And people get caught doing it, they get busted big time and get big fines up to $20,000. So people can really get hit with fees and fines from the local cities for breaking these laws. Coral Gables, for example, they're down in South Florida here as well, just south of Miami. They've completely uh, banned short-term rentals in uh, residential areas as well. So they're not on board with this. And then there's another bill, HB 1537, which is a house bill that would make county tax collectors responsible for administering registration programs. Both bills will require platforms that advertise short-term rental listings to collect state and local taxes. So once again, the local governments want their piece of the pie if people are gonna be doing this, which is gonna increase the cost, right, for people that are uh, renting these Airbnbs. And that's a big problem because there are just way too many Airbnbs these days, especially in Florida, guys. But this is really becoming a very saturated type of real estate investment that's no longer successful because 
I've reported on this in the past about how for some Airbnb operators over the past couple of years, they've seen their revenues drop by as much as 50% in the most oversaturated market. So people that were once turning a profit on this are now losing money. If we take a look at uh, Broward County, for example, I wish I had this data on uh, Miami-Dade County, but for some reason it's not available. But according to a website called Inside Airbnb, I actually used this website in one of my videos in the past, and one of my subscribers, uh, Jamie, just sent this to me today again as a reminder to look at this and say, look, Michael, uh, in Broward County, there's over 18,000 Airbnb listings, okay? Which is even more than what AirDNA is claiming that they have, first of all. And when you look at uh, this chart here, the average Airbnb was only booked 58 nights out of the entire year, which is not very good. Also, only 5,715 of them had any bookings at all, guys, out of over 18,000. That's only about 31% of all of these Airbnb listings actually getting a booking over the past 12 months. That is pretty abysmal. And while we don't know for sure the meaning behind this or why this is happening, we can speculate and take a couple of educated guesses. So my first guess is that there's way too many Airbnbs because look, when you see that there's 18,000 of them operating in just one county alone in Florida, everybody's stopping for the peacocks here. How ironic, right next to the charging Tesla. But at least they can charge it at home. By the way, guys, there are a ton of people that own Teslas around here. I've never denied that. You know, here in Miami, you see this a lot in California, but it's a rich people thing, you know? Rich people drive these cars. It's not like you're gonna see this in bad neighborhoods. Anyways, we can speculate on what's going on here with these Airbnb listings. So first of all, when you have over 18,000 of them and just one county alone, and only 5,700 of them are getting bookings throughout the year, that's pretty bad. So I look at this as either one of two things, maybe both are happening. Either a lot of these listings are just tax shelters, they're properties that people bought, and they list them as short-term rentals, maybe take a couple bookings here and there, just so they can claim it's an investment property and write off all of the losses on it against their income, which helps save them money on taxes. That's actually a legitimate a tax strategy to write off these big losses on your tax return, providing you actually do rent the property out sometimes. You have to rent it out. You cannot just let it sit there empty. And if you try to write off the expenses by doing that, chances are you're probably gonna get nailed at some point down the road by the IRS. But I think this also could be a telltale sign that the broader economy is just not doing as good as we're continually being told. In fact, they say all oh, the purchase of furniture and appliances and all these things are way down, and that's why the prices of these things are coming down. But, you know, people are spending more on travel and going out and things like that. Well, if that were true, how come a bunch of these Airbnbs aren't getting booked? Now, it could just be a simple oversaturation problem. It could just be that way too many people have these Airbnbs, and that's why the majority of them sit empty, about 70% of them, no booking in the last year. So we don't exactly know for sure what's going on, but those seem to be the two most likely scenarios in my opinion. But think about the implications that this has on the housing market, guys. That's 18,000 listings removed from the Broward County housing market in the form of an available rental, so first that somebody could potentially go out and rent in the form of a house that could be for sale, that could contribute to inventory for people who wanna buy a house, and all that inventory removed helps drive home prices up. And so going back to these bills that Florida recently introduced, it makes me wonder if they're really gonna start cracking down on this stuff, if they're gonna really care, if they're going to you know, try to limit the amount of people doing this, they're only gonna give out so many licenses like they're doing in uh, Palm Springs, for example. That has crushed the, the housing market there. We have seen home values go down on the magnitude of 40 to 50% in the past year in Palm Springs because of these new laws there. And so if they start enacting things like this in local counties and cities here in Florida, we could see the same thing happen, guys. If they're saying, you know, in Broward County, 
You're only allowed to have 2,000 or 2,500 licenses at any given time, even though there's 18,000 Airbnbs. All of those Airbnbs would be now up for sale or for rent or both. And even the ones that did get rented in the past year, half of them would no longer be allowed to operate because only half of them would have a license. So it could really be a problem if they decide to change this, which now they have the power to do. Airbnb is causing all types of problems when it comes to people finding a place to live and just shortening the amount of inventory. But kind of related to that, something that John sent me was this story about a guy that lives in Seattle and his monthly expenses are $4,000 a month all in with everything he pays, his rent, his utilities, his going out, his groceries, things like that. And it's kind of pretty close to what I pay per month too to live here in Miami. So a pretty comparable cost of living, which is why this resonated with me. But this guy was curious one day talking with friends like, you know, I wonder if it would be cheaper to live in an all-inclusive resort for the amount we pay to live here in Seattle. And this guy was looking over all-inclusive resorts uh, in Mexico, and he found some of them that were charging a monthly price of $4,500 US for the month to live in an all-inclusive resort. So for only $500 more per month, you could just go and live in one of these all-inclusive resorts in Mexico with all the amenities, all of the food included, you know, maid service, all this stuff, right? If you did the same thing in the Dominican Republic, it would actually cost even less at only $3,100 for the month. And some of his commenters said, hey, listen, I used to work for a hotel. If you call the hotel and ask for like a monthly discounted rate since you're staying for a month, there's a good chance you might get it. So you could actually even get it for less. So the interesting thing is here is you can live in an all-inclusive resort with everything that you need to live in one shot for one monthly fee, or you can live the traditional lifestyle like most of us do and pay all these things a la carte. And I wanted to bring this up because I found it interesting that this is even possible, first of all, that the expenses are roughly the same. But I'm just curious to know, like, how many of you out there would do something like this? Like, it does sound interesting, but to me, I would still rather be paying a la carte for everything because, you know, let's face it, guys, you're living in a resort, you're living in a hotel room, you don't really have your own space. It's just a run-of-the-mill hotel room and you're forced to eat what's on the menu. Yeah, you don't have to do any chores or clean everything and you have the use of the amenities, but it's just not the same as living in your own private space and having all your own stuff. So what do you guys think about that? Here we have a foreclosure listing, folks. It was listed at 5.5 million. Looks like there's trouble in paradise. We don't know how much it's selling for, but just back in 2015, this house sold for 1.55 million. Fast forward to two years ago, the current owner bought it in 2022 for 4.35 million. Apparently could not keep up with the expenses here. I wonder why, because it's super expensive and now they're in foreclosure. As of April of 2023, they're losing the house and whoever's buying it today is buying it through a foreclosure auction and they're gonna get stuck with a whopping property tax bill of $68,000 per year. Who knows how much the mortgage is gonna be. It is just so beautiful and so peaceful and calm out here today on this beautiful February day, as you guys can tell. These are just the days that I live for out here. I know I've said this before, but every time we get one of these beautiful 68 degree days and nothing but sunshine, I just have to say it again. Now, Bob, he sent me this story about this real estate agent robocalling scam that I think most people need to be aware of because if you are a current homeowner, you're likely to fall victim to this at some point. And it's kind of sad that it's devolving into this for real estate agents, you know. And on the one hand, I can't blame agents for, you know, using mechanisms like this and taking chances and actually breaking the law to try and get business because it's tough out there right now. Nobody wants to buy or sell anything due to the high prices and rates. And people are willing to go to desperate measures to get business right now. But what some people are doing is they are paying for this software called things like Sly Broadcast and Sales MSG. And what they do 
is they offer ringless voicemail. I've never actually heard of this. I haven't been staying up on the real estate marketing tactics so much since I'm not practicing as an agent. But what it does is it sends you a pre-recorded message straight to your voicemail box without your phone ever ringing. And what it's designed to do is these messages are supposed to trick you into thinking that you missed a call and they'll say something like, hey, sorry I missed you, give me a call back whenever you get a chance. I get voicemails all the time that it seems like my phone didn't ring and I get a voicemail and it could be from a service like this, but I never call these people back, first of all. But here's the thing, guys, this is illegal. Nobody's allowed to do this. According to the FCC, this is a form of robocalling and it's illegal if the caller doesn't have the recipient's prior consent. There's a high probability they don't. So they're just taking chances that they're not gonna get busted and you're not gonna report them for this. And, and they're also hoping that you're gonna call them back thinking that you missed a call from them. And the idea here is you can send out 500 of these in one day, for example, and then the people who actually bother to call you back have a better chance of needing services of a real estate agent. You try to talk them into using your services, right? If they call you back as an agent. And then there's other types of services like Voice Spin, which is an auto dialing software. And what it will do is it will first put you on the phone with an AI robot until you actually get on the, on the phone with a real real estate agent. So you don't even know if you're talking to a real person if things like this happen, guys. So number one, I don't blame anybody who doesn't answer the phone anymore because I don't. I personally, I don't answer the phone from anybody unless you're already in my contact list. I have that set up on my iPhone. If I don't know you and you're calling me, it goes straight to voicemail. I don't care who it is. So that helps eliminate the possibility of this even happening. So if you have an iPhone, that's, there's a setting on the phone that you can change, guys. You can go into your phone settings. You can make sure that nobody can call you unless they're in your contacts list. But if you wanna get calls from anonymous strangers, then go ahead and leave it on. But you might be falling victim to things like this. There's another company called Yolopo. I don't know if I'm saying this right, but they uploaded a video which showcase an AI assistant conversing with a potential home buyer planning to move to the North or South Carolina coast. The reality is here, guys, like this is not just this doesn't just apply to real estate, but is a re real estate story. But this can happen with any business. So if you don't want stuff like this to happen to you, you need to make sure you're doing business with actual human beings, with actual people you know. So first of all, if you need a referral for a real real estate agent, you can use my link in the description of all my videos. I have this link in there. It's a free service to you. All you do is click it. You fill out a few things about what you're looking for, whether you're looking to buy or sell. And then one of my real estate agents that I work with will get in touch with you personally. It's not gonna be a robot, I promise. It's gonna be a real person talking to you on the other line if you wanna go ahead and work with them. That's one way to prevent being scammed by these AI robocallers. But another way to prevent it is to just not talk to these people at all. Do not call anybody back that you don't know, that you get a voicemail from. And go and meet a real estate agent in person, guys. You know, they still have real estate offices, right? You know, those actually still exist. And if you want to meet a real estate agent face to face, you can just go to your local office and meet who's there. And there's a good chance of whoever is actually there is hungry for your business because when I was first starting off in real estate, I was at the office seven days a week, okay? I was learning the ropes. I was hoping that any client would walk in. I would be able to talk to them and get their business, okay? But guess what happened? After a few years in business, I don't need to go to the office every day anymore. Now I can work from home more. I can generate leads on the internet. Don't need to sit in the office all day. So my point is that if you go to a real estate office, whoever's in there probably really wants to work with you. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be there. They'd probably be working from home. So. That's a good way to get somebody that's hungry for your business and is a real person as well. But overall, real estate agents are getting crushed, man, because in 2022, which was a really good year for real estate, by the way, because we had like record high prices in 2022, record high sales figures in terms of uh, the amount of listings being sold that year. It was just a fantastic year to be a real estate agent. Well, check this out. For real estate agents that had 16 years or more of experience in 2022, they had a median gross income of about $80,700 for the year. 
and those with less than two years of experience made just $9,600 for the year. And I wanted to just bring that up because sometimes people ask me here on the channel, like, oh, you know, about getting started as a real estate agent and all this. And that, that data point right there, guys, just shows you getting into real estate is not, you know, a get rich quick scheme or an easy career by any means. You can be doing this for almost two years and barely make 10K a year. And if you're trying to do it right now, forget it because the transactions have dropped through the floor. But I think a lot of people who are considering getting into real estate should just take that as a, a warning, I guess, that even in the best year ever, basically, for real estate, if you don't have a lot of experience, chances are you're not gonna make a lot of money. I have seen people start and get their license and literally within the first three months they made a million dollar sale and made 30 grand so you know that happens guys people do get lucky but it's not common and one other point to mention is that most agents that get that lucky are let's just say pretty attractive females i won't even say any more about it than that but i think this is bad news for real estate agents trying to do this because you know really all real estate agents have is their integrity and their trustworthiness and if you don't have that anymore then you have nothing you have no business okay and the more agents that start to adopt these ai and robocalling strategies and things for their business thinking that this is really going to help them i think it's actually going to hurt more than it's going to help in the long run and what they're really doing is preying on unsuspecting people that don't know any better that don't know how any of this technology works and they think they're talking to real people and just tricking them so do you really want to work with someone who his intention is to trick you from the very first moment that you meet over the phone i don't think so guys look for a real person okay Use my link or go to the office. Also, if you know of any upcoming Airbnb bans in your local area, make sure to put it in the comments below so people know about this because that seems to be the trend moving forward over the next couple of years. Is I think you're gonna see more and more local towns and cities outright ban it and make it impossible to even do this, or they're gonna make it more expensive in the form of collecting their fees and making sure they get their cut on everything. And ultimately, that's just gonna make going to an Airbnb even more expensive than it already is. And I can tell you guys firsthand from somebody that did a summer road trip last year, hands down, hotels now are cheaper than Airbnbs. For the longest time, it was the other way around, but not anymore. If you wanna stay in an Airbnb, even for a long term, like a month, like I did, that's when you supposedly get a monthly discount. It's still more expensive than staying in a hotel. With more governments starting to regulate this and impose additional taxes, you can only imagine the cost is just gonna go up. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Feel free to keep sending me stories. I love that you guys do that. And if you don't wanna wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here, and I'll see you in the next one.